Does everybody know what a dwarf planet is? <laughs> we covered that. So in 2006, we got a new type of thing called a dwarf planet, where Pluto was, some say demoted, I like to say correctly identified as a dwarf planet. You can fight me later. Uh, basically, it is a, effectively you can think of it as a large minor body that has formed itself into a sphere due to its own gravity. Yeah? Oh, is there a size limit on a dwarf planet? Could it be bigger than the moon and be a dwarf planet? Oh, uh, sure. Um, so the, the issue with dwarf planet is basically it's not a planet because it hasn't, it doesn't dominate its orbit, which is a uh, colloquial way of describing an actual mathematical property where Basically, the majority of the mass in that region of the solar system is in that particular orbit. So as we'll get to later, Jupiter shares its orbit with a bunch of stuff, yeah. right? It's got all of its moons. It's got thousands of Trojans that are also in its orbit. But the, the defining characteristic of that orbit is made by Jupiter's mass. That is not the case with Pluto. In fact, Pluto's orbit is defined by Neptune. So. That really makes, uh, that's, that's what uh, got Pluto classified as a dwarf planet rather than a planet. So, um, all right. Asteroids, roundish mountains in space. <laughs> <laughs> so, anybody recognize this guy? <laughs> no? What if I told you? That's, yeah. Yeah, this image was taken by Dawn. Oh. It's Vesta. It's Vesta. With the snowman. With the snowman right here. Uh. <laughs> All right. So this is for Vesta 1807 ahead. Now, I want to talk briefly about why. <laughs> so, uh, and it has to do with how we name asteroids. And we've been talking a lot about the 2015 uh, TG354, whatever. Uh, right? Like, where do those names actually come from? So, <clears throat> it's kind of ridiculous, but it's what we have. So, um, there is an organization called the Minor Planet Center that we are, as planetary scientists who study asteroids, are very fortunate to have because it is where all of our names kind of get registered. So, when an object is first discovered, it is given a provisional designation just simply based on the day and the order in which it was discovered. To break this down for you a little bit, 1907 XM means that it was discovered in 1907. The X is the half month that it was discovered in. So if you went A, A being the first half of January, B being the second half of January, mm -hmm. all the way through skipping I because it looks too much like a one, and I think Z as well, there's, there's another one that skips it. <laughs> Skip me a couple. And then the second letter is just the simple number order. So A would be the first one, B would be the second one, C would be the third one. Now, that's not that many. That's only 26 every half month. In the beginning, how could you possibly have more when we were first la labeling these? But now we're discovering thousands a week sometimes, depending on the conditions and what telescopes are actually being used. So now we have numbers after them too. Those can get up to three digits, right, um, so far. But what that too means is that we have cycled, we, this is the third time we've gotten to G. Uh, right? <laughs> so we go all the way through the alphabet. That's, that's the first time. And then we go all the way through the alphabet again with a 1 after it. Then we go all the way through the alphabet again with a 2 after it. So forth, so forth, so forth. So when you get to something like 2015 TG 357, I'm going to say a new different number every time. But right, when you have 300 and something, that's, you cycle through the alphabet 300 and something times. Right? We discover a lot of asteroids in a month these days. So. Eventually, hopefully, once we've seen it enough, once we've mapped out the orbit so that we can basically predict exactly where it will be for 100 years from now, it will get, that's rough, but it will get a uh, proper designation, which is a number. And that is simply the number in the order 
that that orbit was defined. So number four Vesta is the fourth asteroid ever with a defined orbit. And then, someday, <coughs> perhaps, if you're lucky, you can get the IAU to name your special object. Usually this will be a request by a discoverer, and there are very specific rules for naming the object. Um, these rules are, I don't know if I remember them all, but they are uh, less than 16 characters. It must be pronounceable in a language. <laughs> uh, <laughs> No pet names, so no names of pets. Uh, it can be named after a famous person, as long as that person was not a politician or known for military things and hasn't been dead for 100 years. Right? So George Washington is fine, right? But uh, Hitler is not, said. Uh, um, yeah, no offense, nothing that could be construed as offensive in any language uh, at the time of choosing. I imagine things can change. Uh, and then there are also very specific, like, for categories of objects, right? So, um, for instance, different, depending on what type of object it is, it'll have a different, like, uh, type of name. So, uh, for instance, most near-Earth objects have mythological names, they try to go with mythological names, so in this, you know, uh, like Apophis, for instance, right, uh, there are Jupiter Trojans, which we'll talk about in a bit, and those are generally named after um, Greek and Trojan heroes in the Trojan War. And then uh, TNOs, typically it's complicated depending on exactly which type of TNO, but generally named after gods of creation or gods of death. So, you know, a little bit of a mixture going on there. But, yeah. So, that is how we name minor bodies. It's complicated, it's kind of obnoxious, but that's what we do. <laughs> and we have lots of them. There are lots of them. So, um, this chart shows you kind of the progression with time of the named in blue, numbered in red, and all in yellow asteroids. We now have, we know about, almost 800,000 objects in our solar system that are not any of the big planets. And 500,000 of them, over 500,000 have well-defined orbits, meaning we can basically tell you exactly where they will be anywhere in the next 100 years. Right? Okay. Joy, what's, what's the smallest size of all those known? Uh, so... That is I, the smallest one I don't know, probably only a couple meters. We know about mm -hmm. objects that could easily fit in this room. We know about objects the size of cars that have flown by. I don't know how many of them are in the numbered category. I don't know the smallest numbered object. Um, but a lot of those, we're getting pretty good at discovering very small <coughs> objects. And the trick is really keeping them. Right? So you may discover an object that's in this total category that isn't numbered, right? You'll look at it, but it's so small, right? If it's the size of a car, right? It has to get very close to Earth before we see it. And then it may be 20 years before it gets close to Earth again, right? It may be five. It depends on where it is. So it'll have to come back around and then be rediscovered, possibly get another one of these names, right? And then... Mm -hmm. You tra start tracking it down, and then eventually you'll nail down the orbit well enough where it can get a number. Speaking of cars, yes. does the Tesla fit in this? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So I had that uh, artificial satellite option, right? So um, no, the Tesla would not be here. In fact, uh, artificial... It is tracked, right? It is tracked, absolutely. But there, that is a completely different organization that tracks artificial objects. Um, and that's also very restricted um, <laughs> occasionally. So I work with NEO follow-up. I look for nearby things that are <coughs> specifically things that might get lost, right? So when we rediscover something, part of my job is to go and look at it and keep track of it so that we don't lose it, so that we don't have to wait. We can get a better orbit so we'll know when it'll be back. Occasionally, 
you do that, you start tracking something, and then a mysterious email comes that says, you've never seen this thing. No. And that usually implies that that's someone's space satellite that they don't necessarily no. want you to know about. So uh, that's an interesting. You just go, OK, delete. <laughs> what is the largest object near the Earth right now? What, what is the size of one that's coming in close? So we get different objects that come near all the time. Um, and that really depends on what your definition of nearby is. Well, um, and nothing the size of the moon, these are a lot smaller. Uh, there aren't any. There's, there is nothing out there the size of the moon. Right? The moon is the biggest thing by far <coughs> in, our, in our local environment. And if you were to compare the moon to any other, of, any other minor body that's not a moon, it would be, it would be much bigger. Right? The moon is bigger than Pluto. The moon is way more massive than Pluto. I mean, it's so, in a, actually a couple slides, uh, we're going to talk about Vesta here, which is the fourth discovered, one of the largest, I think the second largest asteroid in the main belt, right? But it's tiny compared to the moon. Uh, okay, so I want to talk about, so I just want to bring this up. Are y'all familiar with the absolute magnitude system for the solar system? Mm. Y'all ever heard of that? You heard of the absolute magnitude system for stars, mm -hmm. yeah. right? Yeah. So that's, that's basically right. The absolute magnitude system for stars is kind of a, it's a way to even the playing field, right? If it's 10 parsecs away, how bright would it be? Even though it's not, right? So we have a similar system for the solar system, but you can't put it 10 parsecs <laughs> away. They don't glow. They're, they're just reflective. So it's a little bit more complicated. So what we do is it's the, the absolute H, we call it H for heliocentric absolute magnitude. It is the how bright an object would be if that object were one AU from both the sun and the earth. I don't have to explain to this group what an AU is. Um, <laughs> it's an astronomical unit. Um, and if the earth were inside the sun. So this is not a possible what? scenario. <laughs> this won't actually ever happen, but this is how bright, this is how, this is a way, uh, is simply a way of calibrating how bright something would be under these circumstances, because you need to get a single phase angle, right? Because otherwise you're looking up here, you're partially shadowed, right? We want to get it full on. So that is what that means. Now, a lot of times things will appear much brighter than their H magnitude if they get very close to us and they'll appear much fainter than their h magnitude if they're very far away. So uh, ultimately, it's a function of how big the object is and how shiny it is, what, it al what its albedo is. Ice, an object made of ice will be a lot brighter than an object made of coal, right? So speaking of which, Vesta has a diameter of about 500 kilometers and a mass of 0.5. 4% the mass of the moon, which sounds very small, but actually, that's almost 12% of the mass of the entire main belt. There are a lot of things out there, right? We talk about 700,000 objects. It's not a lot of stuff, right? It's many, many objects, but there isn't a lot of mass, even compared to the moon, right? So. Those are kind of the, the main, like some of the big physical characteristics. It's 0.42. Uh, ice would be about one, right? It, it, for albedo, that's how, how shiny it is, how reflective it is. It's pretty dark. Um, and then one other thing when we're talking about asteroids that we need to discuss are the orbital elements. So these basically tell you where the object is, what its orbit is, how it behaves. Now. These are very complicated. I'm not going to go into them in detail. I'm going to throw up a slide that has a pretty picture on it. <laughs> <laughs> and definitions of all of these terms. The big ones to remember for us are going to be A, the semi-major axis. We use the, letter, the lowercase letter A for that, um, which is the, basically the distance between the center and the edge of the orbit. Um, 
I is the inclination, so how much it's inclined with respect to the ecliptic, right? That's the path the Earth takes to the solar system. And then E, which I can't draw a label of on this map because that's how oval it is, right? That's how elongated the orbit is, right? So a very circular orbit would have a low eccentricity of zero, like a circle, and then a very long, elongated orbit, very elliptical orbit would have an eccentricity closer to one. So, uh, and then these are other things that determine that you need to define the orbit. Uh, other little things that I'm going to bring up occasionally are perihelion and aphelion. Uh, so basically, perihelion is the closest point that an object gets to the sun, and that's denoted by a lowercase q. And an aphelion is the furthest away that an object gets to the sun, and that is a capital Q. So. Uh, Vesta has a centimeter axis of about 2.36, which is uh, kind of in the middle of the main belt, right? Earth is at 1, right? Jupiter is at 5. So, yeah. Okay. Again, not a real. Who has determined all these numbers? I mean, so. How do they happen? So that's just, those are the numbers that are just where it is. There are some like sort of uh, like things that we, we've we done, like we've defined an astronomical unit as the distance between the Earth and the Sun, and so that's just the unit we use. We've determined that the distance towards where the Earth is during the vernal equinox to be the zero point for determining things like the longitude of the very axis. We've determined the Earth's orbit to be uh, the reference point when we're determining inclination, right? But I, that's just because you have to have some reference point to define these terms. But once you have those reference points, and once you calculate those numbers based on tracking it through the sky, right? Then those are that's just those are the numbers that come out. That's those are the numbers that allow you to determine the orbit and calculate where it will be at any point in the future. So, all right. So here, we're going to start with the inner solar system, and we're going to, the small centimeter axis, and we're going to move our way out, and we're going to do it fairly rapidly. Um, so this is a neat little map that the Minor Planet Center put out. All the green circles, dots over here, are main belt objects. All of the uh, red, if you can barely see those in the center, those are NEOs. And these blue guys that you may not have even noticed on these sides, those are Jupiter Trojans. This is Jupiter, uh, Mars, Earth, Ven uh, Venus, and Mercury, and the Sun in the center. Um, so, any oats? These are important. These are very important. Um, exactly. So, uh, we know of almost 19,000 NEOs, and these are the things that determine our future in a lot of ways. So NEO stands for Near Earth Object, um, and it's Near Earth Object, and in this case, and not necessarily Near Earth Asteroid, because there are things that come near Earth that are not asteroids, um, like comets. So uh, one reason why these are important to know about is this right here. Y'all know what this some, I heard some people talking about that. Tunguska. Right? That was the largest impact that has happened on our planet in recorded history. So since people have been writing down rocks are falling from space, this is the biggest. It happened in 1908, uh, and it created uh, just miles of devastation. Right? Was, this was a large rock from space that exploded in the atmosphere couple miles up and created this huge uh, kind of butterfly looking uh, zone of destruction where trees were just demolished, just flattened like this for miles in every direction. It's actually really cool. The very center, the trees were still standing, but they were burned to a crisp and all of their branches were blasted off. And everywhere around them, oh, all the trees were knocked down away from the center, right? If you, like, you could imagine something like this happening near an inhabited area, 
Right, this happened in the middle of Siberia. Right? Um, it, there are unsubstantiated rumors that two people were killed in this blast. That has not been proven. No one knows for sure. But if this happened in, you know, Moscow, London, New York, LA, right? This would be huge. This was several hundred Hiroshima's exploding in the atmosphere. So it's important to keep track of these things, know where they are, and know when they're coming our way. <laughs> yes? Now, if that would have been a razor or a bull light, what, what would the train look like? Say that again? If it had been hit by a bull light or a razor, I mean, what? what oh, so probably, if, it, if it had just grazed the atmosphere, probably nothing. Because um, that's the, you would have a flash and things like that. Um, a bolide wouldn't do this because it, it was too big to do that. So a bolide would be the same sort of effect, but a smaller object that usually doesn't even reach the ground. The Chelyabinsk in 2013. Right? Yes. So Chelyabinsk in 2013 it was the most recent large thing that is. Um, did y'all see that story? This was the another Russian asteroid. <laughs> Russia's big. It runs a lot of <laughs> land area. The rock hits on land, so you have chances in Russia. <laughs> so, but that one came through and actually caused a lot of injuries. But not because it hit the ground, but because it exploded in the atmosphere. Everybody saw a flash of light walk to their windows, and then all the windows exploded. Oh. Right? So most of the injuries from that were uh, from glass being blown in on them, right? That was another one that exploded in the atmosphere, basically. But it was much, much smaller. That one was also, it came from the sun side, which is really hard to spot in advance. Mm -hmm. So, yeah? They always show this 1908 picture. Mm -hmm. Well, this, this picture isn't from 1908. This picture is from, like, 1930. Well, what does it look now? Like, there, are any American scientists permitted to go in there and observe uh, that? I'm, I'm sure they are. I haven't looked at that recently, but uh, you can actually even probably Google Earth. 30 years later, you can see it. Yeah, Google Earth probably has a good deal. So it's like a Mount St. Helens effect, right? Yeah. yeah. But on the same scale, smaller than Mount St. Helens then? I don't know how big Mount St. Helens is actually. Big enough. I'm sure it was big enough, but I don't know exactly how this compares to it. But this was a, definitely a massive, uh, you know, like 80 million trees down or something like that. Ridiculous. Um, okay, so a little bit more. So breaking down the NEOs, NEOs can be broken down actually into a couple different categories. So you have the Atiras. All of these are named after like the quintessential example version of these. So these are things that have a uh, aphelion, so it's uh, less than one AU. So these are things that are entirely within the orbit of the Earth. Okay? Uh, you also have that cross Earth's orbit, but spend most of their time inside of that orbit. You have Apollos that uh, cross Earth's orbit, but spend most of their time outside of Earth's orbit. And then you have the Amors that basically never cross Earth's orbit, spend their entire existence outside of Earth's orbit, but get close enough, which we define as basically uh, less than 1.3 AU. So these things get well inside the orbit of Mars, basically. So. Okay, so other things to be aware of when, talk, when you hear about NEOs is that some people say NEAs, the vast majority of near-Earth objects, are asteroids. With, you know, unless you start including artificial satellites in there, and we've got a bunch of those too. Uh, there are also near-Earth comets, and there are things called PHAs, or potentially hazardous asteroids. And these are things that have the that get within a certain radius of the Earth and have the potential to maybe one day hit us. And yeah, so the different asteroids you may see labeled as PHAs at some point. So we have been visiting NEOs, and it's amazing, and yay, we're finally there. So. Hayabusa 2 made it to Ryugu, which has this long number. Um, so it was launched in December 2014, and it just arrived in June. And this is an actual image from the little you know, kind of can-shaped uh, little lander that they dropped onto the surface that bounced around a couple times. Uh, this, is, so this is actual footage from the surface of a near-Earth asteroid. 
Uh, Ryugu itself has an H of 18.69, right? So if you translate that, right, it has to get very close to Earth to be kind of seen really easily. Uh, it has a diameter, it's actually pretty big uh, for an NEO, of a diameter of not quite a kilometer. And its semi-major axis is a little bit outside of Earth's. Do we know the mass now? I do not off the top of my I head. Have to know that. That'd be fun, yeah. I didn't see an update on that from Hayabusa, but I'm sure they have they a better estimate. Eye, they dropped They're something on it. Yeah. So I haven't seen that update. They may just not have published it yet, or I just may have missed it. So I do not know the mass yet. Um, Midterm question. <laughs> <laughs> All right. The next guy that we're going to visit is Bennu. Uh, so this one has an H of 20 and a diameter of only 400 or 500 meters. It has a very similar semi-major axis, and it, notice it also crosses the Earth's orbit because its perihelion is inside the Earth's orbit. So this is a potentially hazardous asteroid. Uh, this is a shape model. This is not an actual picture. Um, we'll get those shortly because... OSIRIS-REx is going there. It was launched in September 2016, and it will arrive in December, so just a couple months away. Mm -hmm. And again, artist renditions is not, you can't get it. <laughs> <laughs> it works. All right. But this is a real picture. <laughs> Sorry? What is the size of that? Uh, of the spacecraft? Yeah. Yeah, so the spacecraft is going to be just a couple meters across. Um, but yeah, the asteroid is like 500. This is an actual first image from OSIRIS-REx of Bennu as it travels across in front of the background star. So this was taken in August from 1.4 million miles away. But it'll be there by December. The main belt. So you stole my joke earlier. <laughs> but, so again, artist depiction. Obviously, we have. So we know about over 700,000 objects in the main belt, but. It doesn't look like this, right? Right? This is something more from Star Wars. <laughs> Which, you know, again. <laughs> right? Our solar system is not hot, right? It is much sparser. So even in like those, I remember the, the diagram I showed you of like all the green uh, that was moving around that was the main belt objects, right? Those single pixel dots, right? are much too large and much too close together for real life, right? There is millions of miles of space between every one of these things. We have to actively design our spacecraft to pass close enough to an asteroid to see one when flying through the main belt, right? It was not coincidence that Galileo passed the Ida that he showed you earlier, right? We designed that mission to pass that asteroid so we could get a look at it. You have to do that for basically any time you go there. So, I already showed you pictures of Vesta, but Don also visited Ceres. So, Ceres, though, it's a honking 3.34 mag, just barely not visible with the naked eye from where it is, about 3 AU away. And it has 1.3% the mass of the moon, right? It's 30% the mass of the entire main belt. Hmm. Right? There is not a lot of material that's left over. Uh, it is very large for the main belt object. It is by far the largest thing in the main belt at almost a thousand kilometers across. And uh, Don arrived there in 2015. Now, this crater here, this is the Cotter Crater. And it has, we've known there's been a bright spot on Ceres for quite a while, because we looked at it with Hubble. We saw this bright thing that we had no idea what it was. We get there, and it's way brighter than we thought it was. Right? We looked at this thing with these big honking pixels that take up a quarter of the surface of Ceres, right, with Hubble. And in that, it, you know, we thought, oh, there is a large white spot on Ceres. No, it is a tiny, very, very, very white spot. Whoops. Sorry? Ah. It's a very small white spot on Ceres. And the current theory is that it is sodium carbonate, which is a salt that 
basically can only be concentrated like that in some sort of hydrothermal event. Mm -hmm. Meaning there had to be water there mm -hmm. that possibly got uh, excavated by this crater, sublimated out, leaving this salty debris behind. Mm -hmm. It is incredibly bright. How does this, yeah. Especially compared to the very dark gray of Ceres itself. Is Ceres lots of water and ice on Ceres? Is... We didn't expect to find much of any. Ceres is well within the frost line. So basically, uh, anything inside of Jupiter should, can't have water ice on its surface if that surface ever sees the sun. Right? So we can have, we have there's actually water ice trapped on the moon in the very deepest craters on the, on the South Pole, and possibly the North Pole too. Um, these craters are on the South Pole, and they're very deep, so they never actually get sunlight. But if any sunlight hits any water, it will sublimate away, right? Which is why comets do their comet thing, right? Now, so in order for there to be water ice on Ceres, which it actually looks like, especially considering the relaxation of some of these craters, Right, so like, take a look at this crater. Right, see how it's kind of very sharp and it's very round and goes kind of deep. And you have this much bigger crater that's much shallower. Right, that's called relaxation. And in order for that to happen, there has to be something happening under the surface. Right, like melting, sublimating water ice that's under the surface. So we believe there is substantial water ice under the surface of Ceres that we didn't know about until now. Yeah. If you were to go there, that would be like the Bonneville Salt Flats, so or Owens Lake, just, just the salt, like the I, Larry Gibson. It's a, I don't know, like you're talking about like the texture of the of the substance? Yeah, just blinding, you know. Yeah, it glare. Will definitely blinding glare. This is actually a dome structure. It's hard to see in this particular picture, but it's not alone, right? There are other little spots that are similar, and there are a couple others on other parts of Sirius as well. But yeah, so I don't, I don't like, it, I don't know if you try to like grab it, what it would feel like. I, I, I imagine some sort of like sandy texture, but that's just me making stuff up. <laughs> Wasn't there also an arm called Mountain on Ceres? Yes, there's a weird mountain on Ceres. I did not get a picture of that. I'm, uh, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, we can, we can, we can go look that up later though. All right, the other spacecraft I want to talk about that's going to be heading to another main belt object is Psyche is the name of the, uh, the, name of the spacecraft and Psyche is the name of the object. I'm, I feel like they could do better. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, but Psyche, the object, is really, really, really cool. Um, it is a metallic asteroid, right? Mm -hmm. So if we talk about like the density of Ceres over here, this is going to be, I didn't actually write it down, but this is going to be like two-ish, right? So two grams per cubic centimeter, so less dense than rock, right? This is four and a half, <laughs> right? So it's, you're, you're, there's substantial amounts of metal in this thing. It is a very dense metallic object, and it's kind of the only really large metallic asteroid that we know about. Oh, um, a lot of the meteorites that we find on Earth are metallic, but that's because those are the most likely to survive entry into our atmosphere and then sit around on the ground for a couple hundred years and then be found, right? So most of the, most of the rocks that hit us are made of uh, silicates and carbonaceous chondrules and basically normal rock-like things. Um, but this guy is so um, this should launch sometime in 2022 mm -hmm. and should arrive by 2026 and then orbit for a good long time. So that the metallic is that a magnetic field? We don't know. We do not know at all. There are lots of questions about this object, and that's why we need to go there. So well, it's like the asteroid that you passed around, that's 70% nickel, which means it's more like stainless steel, which is magnetic. Well, Possibly, but if you batter a magnet enough, it stops being magnetic. So, I, how many times has it been hit? What does that mean? How, did, did it form in a way that would have allowed itself to be magnetized? Right? Like, did it, so it, it's 
We don't know. We don't know a lot of those answers. I would put money on it being somewhat magnetized. Is it kind of reflective? It is fairly reflective. It is not like the shiny white stuff <clears throat> from, uh, but it, it, it's brighter than, it's brighter than say a dark carbonaceous asteroid. Uh, next, I want to talk about the Hildas, just because I love the Hildas, because they exist in this triangle right here. Um, so this is a subgroup of main belt objects. These are outer main belt objects. And they form this triangle in their positions. Their orbits are still circular. Don't mistake <laughs> that. But it comes about because they're in a uh, 3 to 2 resonance with Jupiter. They go around three times every time that Jupiter goes around once. And that allows them to never get close to Jupiter. So Jupiter's down here, right? As Jupiter goes around, you can see in this little diagram, they never, they never get close to it. They only, the closest they get to Jupiter is also the furthest away they get from Jupiter's orbit, right? So that is just a survival bias, right? Because the guys that didn't do that got kicked out, right? They got knocked away by Jupiter's gravity and didn't survive. These are also very interesting, relatively primordial objects out there at the edge of the solar, at the edge of the main belt, um, along and along with the Jupiter trojans, which are a personal favorite of mine. <laughs> um, so these are there's a huge number of these. So you have almost five thousand up here in the L four camp, and almost well less than three thousand down here in the L five camp. And these objects are in a one-to-one -one resonance with Jupiter, meaning they orbit with Jupiter in its orbit, never getting well, much closer or further away than what you see here. So this is a co-rotational frame with Jupiter. So keeping Jupiter in the same spot, this is what they look like. If you let Jupiter orbit, this is what they look like. Where are they originating from? Oh, geez, that is literally the question that would answer. If I could answer that, I could tell you exactly how the solar system for. Right? which is kind of amazing. He asked, where do they come from, right? So all of, our, all of our theories for the formation of the solar system kind of hinge on how these guys got there. If they formed with Jupiter, then that means there couldn't have been a lot of motion, a lot of shaking up of things in the early solar system because they would have all gotten kicked out of those positions. Alternatively, if they got captured, there are lots of them. That means that very many. Uh, objects had to be thrown around the solar system for an extended period of time in order to build these populations up after formation. And where were those originally formed? Were they formed in the outer solar system? Were they formed further into the solar system? These are literally the questions that are being asked right now that no one has good answers to, which is why, oh, sorry, that's this slide, which is why we're sending a spacecraft there. Lucy should be launched in 2021, hopefully. I'm very much looking, uh, looking forward to this. And it will arrive in the first camp, the L4 camp, in 2027. So it's going to make this fun little orbit. Again, this isn't a co-rotational frame with Jupiter, right? So it's going to leave. It's going to spin around, go through this camp. And then by the time it gets back to here, this camp here will have rotated into that position. So it will then go through the L5s. It's going to go pass. Four and a half Trojans, depending on, basically four to six Trojans, depending on exactly what you count to be a Trojan. Um, so mainly it's this binary, it's going to pass over here, thus I'm giving it a 0.54. But what resonance does it have on board? None yet. <laughs> <laughs> so it is still being developed very fast. It just got approval about a year and a half ago. Uh, so it will have imagers and the usual things I'm hoping for. I, I don't know explicitly yet. Those, those have, even which objects it will pass has not been completely laid down in stone yet. Do you have a, a favorite guess? Do you want to guess? Is it going to be old or, for, or is it going to be material um, as old as Jupiter? Or is it going to be Kuiper Belt type material? I'm going for, I, I would put my money on these things being uh, forming past the frost line. Um, whether that means Jupiter dragged them in with it, or they got kicked there by Neptune spitting out into the Kuiper belt, or a primordial Kuiper belt that extended significantly further in, or something like that, I 
I would put money on not being able to turn in that for sure with this mm -hmm. mission. No? I, that'd be my guess, but I don't know for sure. We may see something there that goes, no, these are TNOs if you sit TNOs at 5 AU for a couple billion years. There may be something that we, that we find that says that that is for sure a thing. And we would not have been able to say that before we saw a couple TNOs, right, when we passed Pluto just recently. So, and then we'll be doing that again in a little bit. Question? Yeah. The previous slide where you had all the Trojans and they were in their that, that. Uh, does that mean you know the, you know the orbital parameters of all those Trojans? Absolutely. Okay, so this is a simulation. Um, actually, I believe these are actually, so these are data of, yeah, the, the position of these things plotted in time. So these are actual objects that are doing this. Um, and these are the couple hundred biggest, I don't remember down to what size okay. at this point. I would I'd probably say like an H of uh, maybe 12. So, but yeah. Yes. What was the check? That's a comment. Oh, a comment. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So we'll never see that again that's gone or we'll be here. Uh, yeah. no, it, it, we're not, it's gone. It's no. not going to. Okay. We're not going to. We're, no. <laughs> not Port Philae, the lander, is on a trip, a one-way trip. It will not be, yeah. Hmm. Are there, I don't are, are there more objects coming into that orbit? <clears throat> So Jupiter Trojans are um, so Jupiter Trojans are actually stable. So um, those are my plot of Lagrange points. If you've never seen something like this, so that these points are actually stable with time over the for Jupiter over the lifetime of the solar system. Actually, there are Trojans around other planets too. Earth has one that we know of. It's very small and won't last forever. Neptune has like 18 now. Uh, Mars has a couple. Uh, the Neptune ones and the Jupiter ones are believed to be stable for the lifetime of the solar system. There might be some leakage, maybe. But um, you, it's very hard to capture things in here, which is why if they're not primordial in that position, if they didn't grow up with Jupiter, there must have been a huge flux of asteroids through there because it's very, these are very weak uh, stability points. So most objects that pass through there <coughs> have either too much or too little energy to be caught exactly in that position. So it's very difficult to do. So there must have been a huge number for them to be captured in this quantity later. So the James Webb uh, is going to be put up in the L2 range too? It's a of Earth. 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 Okay. Okay. Yeah, of Earth. How long does it take these swarms of Trojans to go around Jupiter? Well, so they don't go around Jupiter, right? Like they orbit with Jupiter. So they orbit the sun once every 12 years. 12 and years? Well, that's Jupiter's orbit. That's Jupiter's orbit. Oh. Yeah, so they orbit with Jupiter, right? And then these like swarms you see here are on the same period, right? Because they have eccentricity, right? If you imagine all of these orbits, so we have Jupiter's orbit here that's pretty circular, right? Not perfectly, as you can actually watch Jupiter move in and out on this side. But these things aren't as circular. They don't have to be as circular. So they have, they have elongated orbits. So they'll move from the outside of the swarm to the inside of the swarm. Mm -hmm. Basically, as they travel along, they're not quite perfectly circular orbit. Right? If they're too elongated, then they don't work. They're not stable. We do. We have a weirdo over here, and I think... Yeah, He's so he may universe. not be a permanent Trojan. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not done if anything to alter the uh, orbits of these objects with whatever possible of Earth. Anything? Well, with any, because these these guys are trapped here five AU away, or you know four -ish AU away. Um, but some forever. are coming closer, aren't they? Yes, there are objects that get closer, but not Jupiter Trojans. And we have, our main plan right now is to look at them and uh, scramble something if they do, if we start to feel like we're in danger. So <laughs> we, there, are, there are a lot of contingency plans and people are fighting about what's the best one and which one should be funded and stuff like that. But 
Um, yeah. <laughs> we don't have a great plan yet. So <laughs> that's part of the problem. There are actually conferences every year that meet and discuss the best way to handle a specific asteroid. Uh, at, the conferences are great. Every, uh, the asteroid is always on a collision course with the city that the conference is held in. <laughs> <laughs> so you have to go and you have to, you have to figure out, you have to talk about different scenarios and different people play different roles, right? And it's amazing the politics that gets into this, right? Because if you're deflecting an asteroid, right? If you only deflect it halfway, you're just hitting a different country, <laughs> right? If you deflect it all the way but into the wrong spot, then you're putting it in a place where it'll come back and hit somebody else in 50 years, right? So who handles the asteroid deflection exactly? How you handle the asteroid deflection is a political matter as much as a let's protect the world thing. So it's complex. What would be the cost of reflecting billions? Easy. To break the whole budget. No, I mean, well, what's your budget? Like one Iraq war? I don't know. Not a lot. I depend on how you do things, or a lot, depending on how you. All right. So. Uh, I'm going to briefly talk, I'm not going to talk a lot about regular satellites. These are our, the normal satellites that form mm, with the planet roughly. I put Earth's moon on there, even though it's likely formed with a collision after the fact. But these things have nice orbits that are roughly in line with the rotation of the planet itself. Um, and really, I find the <coughs> irregular satellites more interesting. So this is the same image of Saturn, right? These are the regular satellites going around it. Hmm. And then, these are the orbits of the irregular satellites from the same distance. To really get a good look, we're at 140 Saturn radii right now. We have to zoom out to 860 Saturn radii. And yeah, so there are tons <coughs> of these things. So, we've discovered 71 around Jupiter. We've discovered 38 around Saturn, though that number is kind of vague because you know, Saturn has rings and those are weird and there are lots of other ice chunks out there. But and also these numbers get lower more because the planets get further out and a lot harder to see. Not because they have fewer objects. Awesome. So 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 you 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 are tracing the orbits of each one of these objects? Yes. Yes. Yeah, so, so that must be thousands and thousands of orbits that you have. Well, so only, in this case, only 38. Yeah. But, <laughs> but yeah, so in this case, yeah, they're just tracing 38 orbits. Um, yeah. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to breeze through this stuff real quick. So this is a old schematic of the outer <coughs> solar system. Um, you'll also notice that all the data was basically taken in like between 1990 and 2000, so it looks like all the comets are really heading for us. They're all kind of coming in. <laughs> oh gosh! And then, all right, so right around here is when most of those comets were discovered, which is, and then they were mapped back in time and forward in time, which is why it looks like they're all coming in and all leaving at once. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about these. Oh. They gave me a question mark. That's just supposed to be an empty box. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> it translated back poorly. <laughs> um, but anyway, so the, that did have a centaur. Okay, so <laughs> inside the, uh, in between the major planets in the outer solar system is a population known as centaurs. Um, they gained this name because they were believed to be half asteroid, half comet, and mm -hmm. because their major mm -hmm. members are named after centaurs, like Chiron and Polisons. Um, they are relatively, they have relatively high inclinations out of the plane, and they are uh, transient. They will not survive. Because they interact with the big boys out here, <coughs> Neptune, they will eventually interact with one of those planets and be kicked in or be kicked out or be eaten. <laughs> so, all of these objects have to come from somewhere. They are millions of years old, not billions of years old, meaning that there has to be a source, material, a source of material for these. Um, whether that's maybe some objects leaking out of the Trojans, maybe that's 
TNOs, which we'll get to in a second, transit tuning object being kicked in, is not very certain. But some of these guys are actually really interesting. For instance, Chiriclo here, the big guy. So the size of the circle is roughly the brightness, mm -hmm. the size of the object relative to this scale up here. Um, and then their position along this axis is their distance from the sun. And their position along this axis is their inclination. The lines mark kind of roughly their eccentricity. Um, that have to span their orbits to make. Chiriclo has rings. We detected these rings in an occultation event, uh, like we talked about earlier. And uh, it's also one of the largest, well, it's the largest one out here. Pholus is the reddest thing in the solar system that we have so far discovered. It is very, very red. Uh, and, but mo a lot of things in the outer solar system we say are red. Right? But that means they're like a slightly reddish gray, if you were to actually look at them with your eyes. This thing is more like a rusty brown. It's sort of like Utah or something? Basically <laughs> the entire city of Utah, yeah. <laughs> Sedona. Have you ever been to Sedona? Yep. Yeah. <laughs> Can you have models for the orbits of these things that the time and develop a model for where they likely came from? We do. The problem is, is that every one of those models leads us to a close encounter with a major planet. But that's going to tell you where it came from. Well, it's so it will tell us the most recent interaction it had with a major planet. But what we can't determine very well is, so basically, you can plot these things in time, and they have like these jiggity jaggedy sort of orbits that change in some major axis, and then they'll eventually creep their way into like coming next to Saturn. Right? And when it gets close to Saturn, depending on exactly how close, exactly which side of Saturn right, it goes to, that orbit splits in two completely different directions. So we can't trace it either forward or backwards in time very well because we just don't know the orbits precise enough to do that once they get, right, because you get down to like kilometers, right? What's, uh, if we know, we know the position, when I, we know the position to a couple kilometers, right? What those couple kilometers mean that you're a couple kilometers closer to Jupiter or a couple kilometers further away from Jupiter, that makes a world of difference in what your orbit turns out to be in the end. Right? So it's 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 very we, we can trace them back a ways, but we can't span those those close approaches very well. Yet. Yes. We can determine more precise orbits. We can do a better job. Okay. A <laughs> uh, bigger telescope first. <laughs> bigger telescope with all the time in the world. Okay, so finally, the last sort of like main objects that we can really study in the solar system are TNOs, or trans-Neptunian objects. We know of almost 3,000 of these, and we break them up into several subcategories. I didn't do a great job with this into the sub-subcategories, but basically there are two different, three diff four different groups of TNOs. Um, the big ones are the KBOs, or the Kuiper Belt Objects. Now, to be fair, in scientific literature, KBO and TNO is occasionally used interchangeably and to mean completely different things. These are what I believe is a common interpretation of these things. So trans-Neptunian object being anything that's past Neptune, semi-major axis past Neptune. KBO being specifically the things in the Kuiper Belt disk. Those are broken up into two groups, hot classical Kuiper Belt objects and cold classical Kuiper Belt objects. The hot does not mean temperature. The hot means energetics in its orbit. So these have higher inclinations than the cold classical Kuiper Belt objects. Another type of TNO that isn't in that thin Kuiper Belt disk are the scattered disk objects, or SDOs. And these are guys that have eccentricity that's large enough to bring them past Neptune. So there's some major axes past Neptune, but occasionally they go inside of Neptune's orbit. Uh, which means that they probably won't last forever. Unless, these are not actually scattered disk objects, but you have, they are resonant objects. So the, both the Plutinos and the resonant objects are in resonances with Neptune. So even though some of these, see how some of these survive up here, even though this is relatively empty otherwise, right? That's because those are in a 3-2 resonance with Neptune, meaning every time Neptune goes around three times, they go around twice. Pluto is one of these. 
as our favorite. It is the rest of them named after it. Um, but, and the first discovery. But um, basically, because they're in a 3 2 resonance, just like the Hildas, they never actually get close to Neptune itself, even though they cross Neptune's orbit. So uh, they can survive with much larger eccentricities than other things that aren't in that exact resonance. We have other resonances. These are those uh, Neptune Trojans I was telling you about. There are a couple other resonances over here. So there are subcategories of subcategories. <laughs> All right. And notice also this is a long scale. So this is actually 800 AU up here. And this effect, right, <laughs> that is an observational effect. Right, so this is eccentricity. So this is how oval the orbit is. This is semi This is how far away the object is on average, right? But if it has a high eccentricity and a high semi-major axis, you can bet we discovered it when it was way over here, right? So basically, because it's a large oval, when it's close to us, we see them, and we determine from its orbit that it spends most of its time way far away. All right, a couple of notable TNOs. Maybe you've heard of them. <laughs> uh, Pluto and Charon. Pluto has a really long number because it was really late when we determined that it wasn't a planet. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, instead of having like, you know, number 17 or whatever it would be, which would have been a bit higher than that, but uh, it has a big number instead. Look at that H magnitude. This is a shiny, very large object, very, very, very far away. So Pluto spends its time at an apparent magnitude of like 11 to 13 or something like that, that range, depending on exactly what time of its couple hundred year orbit you find it in. Um, and it has a density of less than two. The same major axis is almost 40 AU. The Charon is this beautiful companion over here, and these were obviously taken by New Horizons when it did its close approach in uh, just a couple years ago in 2015. And I can look at New Horizons pictures all day, <laughs> Speaking of which, here's the most recent. So, um, this sexy piece right here is 486958. Or the, <laughs> or it has the name Ultima Thule, which remember when we talked about naming conventions <laughs> earlier? This asterisk here is because that is not an official name. It is a crowdsourced name, <laughs> which breaks Three of the rules? <laughs> so it's uh, problematic. Um, and that's a whole thing. All of Pluto, all the names of Pluto's features are unofficial because of personalities of people. Um, but I want to point out a couple things. Um, so this was taken at almost the same time that that Bennett picture was taken. And, uh, but it's from 107 million miles away. So Basically, a hundred times further away than Bennett was. Hmm. But it arrives only a month later. This thing is booking it. <laughs> it's still going very fast. It's going to blow right past Ultima Thule and keep going out of the solar system. <laughs> and hopefully, we will have some amazing pictures of the second visit to a yeah. Can you talk about how why that picture? Are they trying to darken the stars, but, yes. it, but not perfectly? So it's or? right here in this picture. You can't see it. Um, <laughs> this is a composite of I think like forty images of the same part of the sky. Um, so they built it up and then they subtracted off all the things that weren't moving at all. And so this is a subtracted image. So all the stars are subtracted out, and it's not perfect. Uh, just photon noise, there's a random effect that comes into play here. Um, so all the stars are subtracted out, and that's how they got this image of the actual target. Which is kind of elongated or something. They're thinking it's a, like a, a dumbbell or something, the, the, uh, this object? I don't know yet. Uh, I can't tell from this image whether that's there or just an artifact of the camera. Or I think they're saying that it might be half a tube. Yeah, there, there was some thing of that, but I will... We are notoriously bad at predicting what an asteroid will look like before we get there. I have a picture of one of those in a minute, but yeah. But I think that lobe structure possibility comes from some occultations that they Yes, there are occultations of it that do show that, but 
we are, even with occultations, we've done occultations before, and we did not expect rubber ducks. So, <laughs> <laughs> so there are also comets. This is comet Neat, which I think is neat. And there we have about 3,500 3, uh, 3, known comets. This is 67P Chirimala Gershmenko, which I have never pronounced correctly, so I rushed through it. And this is a poor rendition, but it basically looks like a rubber ducky. Right? <laughs> and if you look at the initial like guesses for what it looked like from occultation measurements, it was very roundish, but maybe like a one side slightly larger than the other. It did not look anything like that. We are very bad at this, just a thing. Uh, but this one's about four kilometers across. Uh, it, its density is significantly less than one. Hmm. It is a rubble pile of ice. Hmm. Blasting off. So um, where did that little uh, camera thing land? I had it bounced. It, kind of in here is yeah. somewhere. Um, it might have been on the other side, yeah. I don't remember. Yeah. But it bounced around a little bit until it landed in shadow, unfortunately. Yeah. Right. I took a couple pictures, and then it found it again for just a second, yeah. and then it left. What would be the depth of that little Grand Canyon? So this whole thing is four kilometers across, give or take. Maybe one. Right. So the wall is less. A little so, cool, like, a uh, kilometer, kilometer and a half more. Like a mile? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. No. Uh, so maybe like a mile. Yeah. Mile yeah. That's the mile. Well, because you can really think about this as two separate objects that are joined together in a small neck. Yeah. Right. And because of like the angle of repose on this thing, it's very weird. Right. There's actually beautiful plots that I would recommend you go look up of the uh, of the surface gravity of this object mapped to its surface, right? And it's very bizarre, like the arrow, like there are arrows that point where, like which direction is up, and you get some really weird sort of like, like this is up over here, so like if you were standing there, it would be very much leaning against the, kind of the side of the surface, and the very, mm. slopes get very weird on objects like this, because they're so, like look, this thing is, it's, it's, it's like fluff. <laughs> it's like it's like standing on foam. It, it, there is no density to it. There's hardly any mass there. It's very light. So gravity gets weird in those sorts of situations, and you probably barely notice. Like stepping would be risky because you might leave. <laughs> so the bigger impact. Oh yeah, yeah. And things get blasted off, and things fall back on, and it's it's pretty incredible. All right, and we mentioned the Oort cloud earlier. Here's a diagram of that. And so to kind of address a little bit, uh, so it forms a sphere with a disk in the middle that kind of merges into the Kuiper belt and into the planetary region and things like that. This whole thing goes out to 100,000 AU further, halfway to the next nearest star. <laughs> it's big, and we don't have any good idea of how big it is. It's estimated that there are about five Earths worth of stuff out here, and that's determined by how much mass we've seen in comets. The entire Oort cloud is presupposed by the fact that we have comets coming in at all different random angles, right? There has to be some source for those comets to come from, and it has to be all around us, not just in any one direction. So you look at the size of those comets, how frequently those comets come, and then you make a random guess about, you estimate how much stuff is out here. Do you have yeah, some idea how many of those work club comments there are? I mean, I know we call them long period comments. And yeah. Period, but, um, but I thought they're, they're like a million years, right? Or two million years, that kind of extreme period. Right, right. So, I, I, so, so most of these aren't comments, right? Most of these are never going to come near us. The vast, there could be trillions of objects out there. But do you know how many? Comments we've actually seen that we've identified come from the work club, like a right. We, we we would add so uh, so basically long term long term comments or uh, long period comments instead of uh, hundreds or thousands in, in the order of hundreds to hundreds. a thousand or so. Uh, most of the comments that we see are short period Jupiter family comets, which spend most of their time up. But you know, basically they go out past Jupiter and they come back in. Depending on where exactly you are. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, the helio sheath is actually 
inside. Right. Um, the bow shock. The bow shock would be outside. Outside. Yes, I believe. But yeah, like these are trillions of objects orbiting basically almost stationary in space, right? Because you have to move. You don't have to move hardly at all to miss <coughs> the sun from that distance, right? And then finally, <laughs> we have our interstellar interloper, not real. <laughs> um, it has, so when I say diameter here, it's about 230 meters in this direction, and we believe it's about 30 meters in this direction, wow. and 30 meters in the other, the other direction that I can't point to. I thought it was 220 right. miles long. So it's, it's, a, it's a cigar flying long. through space, tumbling in all sorts of weird ways that don't make any sense. Um, and yeah, so we believe it is interstellar, not from our solar system, not from the Oort cloud, because its orbit is hyperbolic. It is coming in and it is leaving, and there is nothing that's going to stop it, and uh, it is not going to turn around at any point, and you just can't get in orbit like that if you were ever around the sun. So, well, I say that, but. We, we've done it a couple times, but that's a different issue. <laughs> so what's that H referred to right now? Is that the current H or? This, so the H, that's why it's an absolute magnitude. Okay. So the H, is, the H is constant. Okay. The H is if you move to I didn't see an H for um, two of your models. Did you have one for that? You no, because it's a comet and comets are weird. Oh. So comets this are is. more complicated. And Comet's H does kind of change with time, depending on how big the halo is, how much outgassing there is. Right? So, so you have actually two magnitudes with comets, and they have to do with the halo size and the nucleus size. So you can have an estimated, because we use H so much, we actually estimate an H for the thing that you can't see most of the time, which is the nucleus, all by itself without a halo, because we use that as a proxy for size. And so it, no, I did not include an H, good I, for the comet, because comets are weird and they technically have multiple magnitudes and it's obnoxious. Is this a uh, Muma metallic? Don't know. No idea. They don't know? No. Uh, they, this Whoa. is as close as they got right here. Yeah, so it came in, we discovered it, everybody was very excited, we pointed spectrographs at it. It doesn't look metallic. But I don't know any more details than that because that's hard to do, especially if they only come in and leave. And also, this is very faint. Yeah. Do you but if it's tumbling like that, that implies it's somewhat <coughs> rigid, right? Presumably, but we, because the light curve was so complicated, we don't have a great idea of if it's not like, this is our estimate. We did not get radar of this. You could imagine three objects that periodically line up in a line that we see, and then one of them's doing this sort of thing, the other one's doing this sort of thing, right? Like, we don't, we don't have a good idea. So, this could be a binary, it could be something else, but it is weird, and we did not get a great look at it, and it's gone now, and we'll never know. <laughs> uh, not well. So we have a lower, we have, we have a lower estimate of the density uh, that we can manufacture based on the light curve, based on its period, right? So, basically, if it were, if it were, Less dense, if it were less dense than some number that I don't know off the top of my head, I'm sorry. Uh, it just looks very dense. Well, this is, they drew it this way. Yeah, it looks like a solid piece of rock, which it might be, yeah. right? In which case, it's probably pretty dense. It could be six boulders clung together yeah. with gravity in a weird formation. It could, you know, and who knows? But, yeah. All right, and this is the only one of these. <laughs> so far. We've had, there are other suspected things, but this is the only one that we've confirmed with a truly hyperbolic orbit. Um, we have some parabolic orbits that are hard to do, but not impossible. Um, but yeah, so that's it. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Joey. My pleasure. You were one of the best we've ever had. Yeah. Oh, thank you.
So, uh, so, so um, Wayne Rosling is the founder of okay. the Observatory. He is still out there. He doesn't work directly with us. He has his own projects that he works okay. on. And then um, uh, Todd Anderson is the uh, current director at the moment. Can we come drop in? Or do we have to make it work in this? All right, sure. The, dropping in, if you, you probably could, but uh, that wouldn't be the best experience. Oh, right. If you want a good tour, if you want like, to show up when open people house. are there, go to one of the open houses. Yeah, yeah. There's free food. We get cakes usually. Uh, uh, Last time we had a taco bar. It was amazing. Yeah. Uh, we're all coming. Yeah, yeah. 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 absolutely. So um, I don't know off the top of my head what the next one is, but you can look it up really easily on the website. If you just go on the website, go to the For Everyone, and then click Events, okay. there will be a calendar, and you can see all the upcoming events. You got, uh, uh, you got telecoms around the world. Is there one out here? So we have one at Sedgwick. Uh, oh, go over the hill. Mm -hmm. Over the hill. Uh, and we also have one in the back parking lot called Back Parking Lot. <laughs> um, I didn't name it. Okay. Uh, but but uh, yeah. So if you come to our open house, you can absolutely see that tells you. You can see all the telescopes that we're working on at the moment that will be in the shop. There's a warehouse in the sure. back. Um, there are a lot of like half finished telescopes. Right now, there's actually like most of a dome set up inside. It's a one meter dome. <coughs> they're going to deploy to Texas in a bit, but they're just constructing it out, making sure they have all the pieces and everything fits together, right? Um, so you come to the open house, you can see that sort of stuff. Uh, but it, again, right? Like we're in Goleta. You're not. We're not. We don't do like sky observing. It's usually over by, the open houses are usually over by dark. <laughs> um, just because, well, first of all, our thing is that it's always night somewhere, right? So it's true. Uh, it's always. And most of it is to see the telescope, not to look through the telescope. There, as far as I know, there isn't even an eyepiece on the line back. Well, it's like the British Empire. The sun always sets on you guys. That's the idea. Yeah. yeah. Our yeah. motto used to be uh, LCO, we keep you in the dark. I got it. Uh, one final question, then we're going to eat. Are you available for my talk show on the radio on Wednesday morning at 9 o'clock? Sure. I don't have a guest. I'm looking for somebody. Otherwise, I'll rerun an old one. And we have a show we do on Monday. If you're near a radio and it happens to have AM or go online, newspress.com. Okay. I want to hold my breath here do it, but we have a little show twice a month that didn't get mentioned, and I get the brain trust in there, and we talk. So uh, we're going to eat. I'd like to ask you if you'd like to go first, and then you can probably come to the science group who's in want to talk to you. But sure. first, yeah, please let me oh, present oh, you our priceless porcelain cup. <laughs> yeah. Thank uh, you so much. Of which, if you want the whole set, you're going to have to come back seven times. <laughs> 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 Thank <laughs> you.